In this episode, the entire audience for the first public sale came from one video, a nine minute video that Kyle created. And I, I still tell him today, it's a masterpiece in marketing. He spoke for nine minutes without giving away a single detail of what we were building, which I thought was incredible, right? And the whole first sale was funded from that one video. At that point, people knew very little about us, right? We came out of stealth for the first sale. We did the second sale. And people were just amazed that we committed stealth because one, we'd already, we weren't coming out and making a claim. We built it first and then showed it to people. And that made a big difference, I think, in terms of that transparency. Most of the people, community is a Telegram channel or it's a few people on Twitter. For us, the community forums are right in the middle of the application itself. So there's zero friction. Being, uh, let's say, uh, open and brave to change directions. We built some great piece of software, but we saw the possibility in better in, uh, in better use of the yeah. product of their or the idea for the community mm -hmm. and we change it and we just okay that's a pity but it will be better the other way one of the gaps in the market because of the state of regulatory compliance it means that many of the big nft marketplaces um want to stay compliant themselves so they won't sell our nft or list our nft because it's got real world utility value but it's also in some cases um a security. So there is no decentralized NFT marketplace purely for utility-based NFTs. In a couple of weeks, we'll have launched our own listings inside the platform, but the plan very much is to hive that off as a standalone product that anyone can sell an NFT on. Welcome to Pragmatic Talks, a podcast and video series where we discuss startups, contemporary digital product development, modern technologies, and product management. We believe that everyone should have equal access to knowledge about product development and entrepreneurship, and also everyone should have the opportunity to apply it in pursuit of making our world a better place. Through this series, we aim to create an impact on the future world. Some of you are probably familiar with the two awesome guests we invited today. Tony is a core team member of Commonwealth, a revolutionary web-free startup that is democratizing investment opportunities for regular people. Our second guest, whom you have probably seen before in one of our previous episodes, is Jacob Dobosz. Jacob, as a part of Pragmatic Coders team, is taking the role of product manager at Commonwealth. Today, we are going to talk about key factors of startup success, based on the recent history of Commonwealth, where they were able to attract more than 40,000 users to perform over 1.6 million actions in the product, which has not even been completely released yet. This is an astonishing story of how to grow your business and user audience even before you launch your product. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tony Kelly and Jacob Dobosz. Hi there. Uh, welcome in the next episode of Pragmatic Talks. Today with us, we have Tony Kelly and uh, Jakub Dobosz. You may be familiar with them from some of our previous episodes because uh, one of the very first episodes that we recorded was with uh, Tony here. And uh, one of the other episodes where we discussed how we work at Pragmatic Others was recorded together with, with Jacob. Uh, but today we are going to discuss about another uh, brilliant company and uh, actually one of the most amazing startups uh, I've ever seen and I ever had the pleasure to work with, which is uh, Commonwealth. Tony, I think that you are the best person to tell us more what the Commonwealth is. I'll try. I'll try. Um, yeah, where do I begin? Commonwealth is quite complex, I suppose, in some ways, but it's basically a community-owned and operated investment platform. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring um, early stage venture investment to retail investors kind of worldwide. We're specifically focused on uh, blockchain startups uh, and blockchain projects, but that enables us to build this automated, unstoppable machine that will be fully decentralized, that anyone can come in with $20 and a credit card and invest in early stage uh, crypto companies. We provide all the scaffolding and rails to go with that. So we provide the education, the infrastructure for doing all this in a completely seamless way. And we've invested quite a lot in kind of a user first approach, both to the interfaces and even to making the protocol run really slick and seamlessly. Um, I think that's probably the, the simplest, uh, shortest explanation I could give you. I think we'll dive into that uh, later on. Tell us more about what, what are your roles, Tony? I, when I go through your LinkedIn profile, I only seen that you're a core team mm. uh, member yeah. when I uh, seen actually every other person in your team, they have the same title. So how does it work on your side and, and how does it work in Commonwealth? Who is who, who is responsible for uh, what and, and how does it work? 
That's a good question. And actually, I realized the other night when I was reviewing the white paper that we're updating uh, at the moment that myself and Tim completely left off mention of that. And that's actually quite an important part. So um, Commonwealth is meant to be run, um, as I said, it's community owned and operated. And once we have, you know, a token on the market, so to speak, everyone who holds that token has governance rights uh, on the platform. So we started day one um, to build the organization as a DAO, as a distributed autonomous organization. So we don't have job title, literally no one has a job title in Commonwealth. They were the two founding companies uh, who came together to form the idea. Um, and the initial team then was Ian from Master Ventures and myself. I was brought in as the first kind of external hire. So I was nominally the project lead, right? For the first half of the two and a half years we've been in development, uh, we were designing and building the protocol and platform and then laterally with you guys. But we don't have job titles as such. So my responsibility is kind of product and technology, um, obviously. Now we have um, Tim is in leading the kind of marketing and biz dev side of things. Mm -hmm. We've had various people come in and out on the marketing side. So um, we're just about to scale up. So right now we don't have job titles, as I mentioned. There's two roughly um, divided groups. We work very closely together on all the marketing and operations piece. Um, and then obviously we work with you guys on the product and dev side. Um, so um, there's about, what, 11 people? No, but yeah, 11 to 12 people, I think, in total between the Commonwealth folks and yourself. And, you know, we don't really use job titles as such, and we don't plan on it going mm -hmm. forward. We're already trying to break down the barriers between the team and the community. So the community are in now managing support and the community moderation piece. And then with some of the technology we've developed recently with you guys, the plan is to expand that and bring in even more people to take on more of those roles. So that over time, there's very few people left who are professionally employed by the team and the um, the the path to decentralization and to being legally compliant in this space is to be fully decentralized um, and there's a, a growing understanding of what sufficiently decentralized means and it basically means the team has surrendered quite a lot of control mm -hmm. over the protocol and the technology so in a couple of weeks when we launch our token we will launch it and we'll have burnt the the keys to the wallet so it'll literally be a permissionless token anyone in the world can use no one owns and over time we will do the same with all the core technology that we've built as well it will all be open sourced and open to the community but yeah no job time so Jacob what is your responsibility mm -hmm. not the yeah, I mean, <laughs> in this uh, setup I'm from Pragmatic as uh, Tony mentioned we, we are working together like almost two years uh, and my role is to, to manage the product uh, from from our side to to work with the team uh, to work of course very closely with with with, uh, with you guys with Commonwealth to deliver the product to the, to the community because uh, uh, we believe that this is like ultimate value like uh, I, I wanted also to say that we do not have uh, titles <laughs> but still roles or responsibilities are are in place in terms of the Commonwealth itself, so what is so unique in, in Commonwealth or what is so so innovative uh, that uh, brought such an att attention on the market, uh, especially recently after your public release? Uh, we'll discuss it more. Hmm. Uh, but what's what's so unique that, that brought so, so much attention, at least hmm. from your perspective? We were talking about this a little bit earlier on. I think there's a couple of things that are unique. I think one of them is just... The team we brought in on Commonwealth, we very much decided earlier on that we were going after quite a big prize. We knew we would be the first kind of automated VC and potentially creating the world's largest venture capital um, protocol or organization, if you like. So we said our goals were pretty high. So we decided that we were going to early on only work with the best. So, you know, we've, we've, we've spoken previously about the tender process we went through before we found you guys. And it's the same with a lot of the staff as well um, likewise that's then carried across to like the personnel part of Commonwealth I think part of the secret sauce um, that makes us innovative apart from the features we'll talk about is the model and the model is based on us having this huge network um, of venture capitalists angel investors influencers and partners who are just incredibly active in, in the space and as you know the space is always changing very very fast so um the oracles are the, the folks who recommend these early stage deals to us. And part of our kind of commitment to the community is this is not just a random project. Somebody decided a meme coin that they want to ape into and are trying to encourage everyone to buy. 
these people have already, they do this for a living. They've already invested in these companies. So that has to be kind of the first soft signal, if you like, before they bring it to us. And then I think the fact that the community gets involved at such an early stage and decides if they're going to invest into that, not just into that fund, but if that fund should invest their money into those projects. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we could talk all day about the technology around that, but I think that from the community and the oracles and the technology and projects all very closely knit together from the beginning. And the fact that it's a very hands-off management process all the way through to the end, that's kind of the main, I think, USP for a lot of folks who are coming along. But I think I'd be remiss, and if I don't mention it, I'm sure Jakob will, but we're very user-focused mm -hmm. in Commonwealth. And at the beginning, we knew we had at least two different audiences, right? We've got this very casual audience who want to come in and don't want to get involved in all the technology and the research, but just want access to those deals. But we also have this very educated, techno savvy group of people who have a very different uh, kind of agenda, if you like, in terms of how they acquire tokens and yeah. invest in projects. So um, trying to meld those two together and always looking out for both sides of that equation is it obviously an enormous part of it. And then lastly, I just have to say that, you know, we're very much building this to provide opportunities to a whole economic class that ha don't have access to these deals. If you look at the video I published today on the website, which is from one of our partners, where he gives an overview of how a, a blockchain VC works. It's a fantastic overview of all the pieces. But when he takes you through the business model of a VC, you begin to see, oh, these guys almost never lose money. It's not their money. They make massive profits off of me running my investment. And if the project does well, they take, you know, 20, 30, 40% on top. But with the dynamics of them getting into this deal so early before it's even at a public sale stage, they can't lose. They're on a league of 30 or 40 X. Right? And there's a great example we give in one of our first blog posts of the very first external investor into Apple. And we take you through the evolution of what his portfolio is worth today. And you can see that even a couple of years after Apple launched and the token, their stock price went down, he was up 20 to 40 X. So he literally can't lose, right? So to provide that kind of opportunity to the man on the street, the woman in, you know, in the middle of Africa somewhere where she barely has a kind of mobile connection, mm -hmm. to be able to get access to that kind of opportunity and to not have to be an accredited investor with a million bucks in your pocket ready to spend. That's literally the definition of a US accredited investor. Mm -hmm. $300,000 in income and a million in disposable income you could afford to lose. That puts me out of most deals. I don't know about you guys, right? But even if I could get into that deal and I was able to, the minimum ticket size is often $100,000, $150,000, right? So we're bringing a crowdfunding model, we're bringing blockchain technology, we're bringing these venture capital deals, and then we're bringing in the oracles all in that nice, neat package. And it, it's a lot to explain, but that, I think, is at the heart of what makes us special. Uh, you mentioned user-centric, user focus. Uh, Jacob, maybe you will mm -hmm. tell us more about the, how, how does it work, so what does it mean for you, for the team? to be so much user focused basically it means that uh, mm, when we when we develop when we think about functionalities the first thing that comes to my mind okay how how the user will use it and and what the value will will it bring to them and how they will understand it and mm. what you don't imagine is like we have different set of users uh, like our goal is to get the platform, the, the product to everybody. So even with some, somebody that has little knowledge of, let's say, blockchain technology and how the investment works, how the economy works and so on, they can use the application. From my perspective, uniqueness of Commonwealth is uh, also the transparency. Because blockchain projects are not from the transpar transparency side. We are right now combining Web2 and Web3. So Mm. Uh, we are we are trying to take the best of both technologies. Yeah. So we are kind of introducing transparency to Web2 technologies, let's put it that way. Mm. I'm astonished how the community is being involved. Like mm. when we run the recent uh, uh, deployment, they were super, you know, like active. They were uh, supporting, they support each other. And that's what, mm -hmm. the, the, that means that we did a good job. Same for the beta test as well. I think we were pleasantly surprised when we opened up the app finally and let people in on it. I just started taking screenshots of all the praise we were getting because 
like if I go back a stage, I mean, we did two fundraising stages through um, the Genesis NFT. And at that point, people knew very little about us. Right? We came out of stealth for the first sale. We did the second sale. I haven't been pretty transparent. I think we showed all the high fidelity figmas. I, I'm not sure where else we had to show at the time. And people were just amazed that we committed stealth because one, we'd already, we weren't coming out and making a claim. We built it first and then showed it to people. And that made a big difference, I think, in terms of that transparency. But I remember on the night of the second sale, um, when we'd seen the feedback and we're having a conversation with the leadership team in Telegram and say to Kyle, said, Kyle, I've worked 30 years in technology and I've never had a technology platform that was this ambitious, so I'm highly motivated, this level of product market fit. And it's a social good. Mm-hmm. I spent 20 years of my life helping teenagers shoot each other in the face. And I'm kind of, at times I would sit there going, I'm not really helping cure cancer, am I? I'm not really bettering people's lives, mm-hmm. right? It's just entertainment. But with uh, Commonwealth, it very much is as much a social good as it is a technology platform, you know? So, In, in terms of how does it work, uh, recently you had this successful release that I mentioned. And could you tell us a little bit more? I think that that will also uh, describe well how the Commonwealth work uh, and uh, why does it work and, and uh, what, what's so unique in that as well. Yeah, I guess you're referring to the free fund promotion that we did, right? So, um, yeah, we're launching our first paid fund. It's a fund-based model um, just before we do the token distribution in a couple of weeks' time. Um, and each fund has a portfolio of projects in it or a growing portfolio of projects which people can invest into the fund. And then on a case-by-case basis, as we do the research, we decide which ones we want to invest into. So to launch the platform, um, we came up with a clever idea where we were going to do a fund, but we approached uh, some promising projects that the oracles knew and said, look, you guys are getting ready to launch. So are we this year. So we have this great activity on our platform um, where we're going to give people rewards effectively for engaging with the projects and learning about your project, interacting with your protocol, discussing it on social media. Um, if you basically in return for them giving us tokens into the free fund we basically decided we would run this large scale program and then give away to the winners we would give them a piece of the fund mm-hmm. and the way the funds work is when you invest into one of our funds you're given an NFT we call it a slice as in your slice of the pie um, which memorializes your investment and that that's your portion of the fund so we gave away these slices and you think about it these are we're changing people's lives like we took 1060 people and they've all gotten a slice of the world's first venture capital fund so it's completely free when those um, slices are minted and airdropped them in the next couple of weeks they own a piece of that fund so any returns that come in from any of those 15 projects over the next four or five years they owe and because uh, it's a free fund there's no charges or management charges or anything like that in it when I saw the ambition that uh, Dom, who brought us to market from the marketing side, and Tim had, I was a bit daunted, I'll be honest. <laughs> and initially, I was like, the tech team have no time to work on this in the next three months. We're doing crazy things just to get to that deadline. But it meant the the size of what they wanted to do meant working with a number of external systems, which would have meant the tech and product teams having to basically run two marathons at the same time to try to deliver that amount of work. And the problem was it didn't solve many of our problems. And at the scale people were talking that we would get, we were looking at months and months of manual work, even after the fact, just to verify all these missions and maintain competitive integrity. So long story short, um, I had a difficult weekend where I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this. Um, I went back over some old code and designs I had, and I realized I had two code repos that actually would fix parts of the problems. And It wasn't nearly enough, but it gave me the idea that actually maybe we could actually do some of these problems in such a way that we could reuse this tech afterwards because everything that we needed to do, we had to do anyway. We just didn't have the time to do it now. And I brought it to the team and we discussed it and um, it looked like it was going to be tight, but it looked like we could build this tech ourselves. What we didn't realize at the time, I think, was some of the problems we were solving hadn't been solved before. Like there's two, at least two commercial partners who run rewards platform tool. They've no automation on the back end. Um, if you have a really good project and you have tens of thousands of people completing the missions, every one of them has to be verified manually by someone. And then there was just all the problem of getting all that data into where it needed to be. So long story short, and Jakob can probably tell you through this story better than I can, but 
over get the time we were getting ready for TDE, over an 11 week period, we went from idea to a fully implemented and released reward system that was grafted onto our back end. Um, and because it was actually quite successful, not only was it successful from a commercial point of view in terms of 68,000 people registered in the app, I think about 40,000 people um, undertook the missions to some extent. We had 1.64 million missions completed in three weeks, which is phenomenal. Towards the end, we had the average per hour of the free form promotion was 3,270 missions complete per hour. And just to make you aware of what the mission is, like... Yeah, missions ranged from, you know, follow this uh, project on Twitter to create a meme and use these hashtags on Twitter for that project. Um, because Commonwealth is in the free fund as well, we made a lot of our missions finding out about the, the free fund projects on Commonwealth. So you got to actually learn how to do due diligence for a project, which you would be doing if you're investing anyway. Um, and you'd have to go and you know prove you'd answer the question and whatever it may be. And then some of them were quite involved. Some of them involved like some of the projects wanted people to actually transact on their platform or connect their wallet to the platform. So the I think it was something like 17 million social impressions across the 15 projects. So again, just as a marketing activity, it was a phenomenal success. But I think from our end, and um, Jakob's probably too polite to talk about how difficult the process was because we built the front end and the mission on the back end, but we had no back end for managing it and analyzing it and managing the anti-cheat and dealing with a million and one customer support issues. So there wasn't a lot of sleep for those three or four weeks, I think it's fair to say. Um, and that's the place we plan on, you know, scaling and making more robust in future. But I should say the free fund, as I mentioned, the promotion, the technology and the operations around that are going to be permanent on the platform for every project. So we need to figure out now how to do this on a permanent basis, but at a smaller scale. And the interesting thing is we did such a good job. We've already been approached about spinning that software off as a standalone service. when It's already years beyond its two competitors and we've barely started on what we plan on doing with it. <laughs> So basically what you did with this uh, reward system is that you create a platform that incentivizes people to make some actions on that will support some startups yeah, uh, that, that are part of the global fund. It's a marketing engine, basically. Marketing engine. Yeah, there's, a, there's an expression in um, a Link Army, which I think came from a crypto project years ago, where they were able to galvanize their entire community to just be these massive supporters and ambassadors for the protocol. And ideally, that's what everyone, every online community wants that, especially in something like crypto, which is very narrative and community driven. What we've built is this massive um, promotional engine, if you like, that's tied into the investment platform and the portfolio projects on it. So that the not only will Commonwealth users invest into your project, they're the best ambassadors to go and sell it on your behalf. So. We use proceeds from the protocol to incentivize people to use the protocol to benefit the projects. Um, and it's a nice virtuous mm -hmm. circle, which ties in very well with the circular tokenomics we have. Uh, I've also heard that uh, thanks to this, this marketing actions, some of your portfolio projects uh, were pretty successful as well already. Yeah, one of the projects launched actually right in, I think it was in this, this was this, the end of the second week of the three week promotion and on its first day it went did multiples yeah it, it, it added nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars in value to the free fund on its first day on the market and <laughs> now we don't expect all 15 projects to do that of course generally speaking like about 20 percent of the projects in any fund won't even launch they'll never get to dde which is unfortunate but of the 80 percent do average or better everybody wins but with those kinds of wins you know uh, it should pay back the funds should get to break even very quickly and just start paying out USDC to these investors. And that's uh, many of funds could say that they are profitable from the day one. That's part of the design. We've been quite clever in how we design yeah. the, the fund and the protocol. Like it's designed to fill fast and be successful fast and return value to the investors as fast as possible. It's your money. You know, give it back to you as quickly as possible. Cool. So Jacob, how does those, uh, how did it uh, look like from your perspective? I mean, product management, team that was trying to uh, you know, work as hard as possible, as fast as possible, because the deadline were, were close. So how did it work for you? From the perspective of time, it would be great. <laughs> yeah, we were successful. Like uh, we, we could expect this amount of uh, mission being accomplished because we had some, uh, let's say, um, 
information that were, you know, like the calculation that you did before the, the free fund started, the reward program started. So we, we were kind of prepared, uh, but at the same time, when it actually happened, uh, we were still, you know, like, um, trying to deliver as much value to the user as possible. For example, um, chase cheaters, you know, like, uh, we didn't account for that earlier, like what would be the process for that. But we saw during the course of the program that there might be some people that are not using the platform, the reward program properly. So then we, we needed to take actions uh, to that. And when I was listening to you guys talking about it, I, I realized that this is also the part of like uh, front facing the customer. Uh, as you mentioned, like we might change somebody's lives and, and to, uh, it is, from my perspective as a product manager, it's like a win-win situation because uh, on the one hand, uh, we have a nice launch of the platform and we are inviting people to join. At the same time, it they are getting something and mm. it's real value. It's not like, you know, like some uh, meme or some mm. worthless token or something, you know. So, so, so this is kind of, kind of a thing that helped us to go through, let's say, a little bit more difficult times, you know, where there was no, no path of sleep. Uh, and at the same time, you know, I prefer it that way rather than, you know, wake up someday and there is nobody on the platform. You know? <laughs> so we, we had the discussion before uh, the free fund started. What if analysis? Like what, what happens if there are not many people? There are also peers, you know, and when, when you start, when you launch, when you, when you start. But yeah, it, 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 it was, you know, great experience in terms of also the support that we received from the community and how they, how the mods were working with the, with, with people that took part in the rewards program. So it, it was great. I have to comment on that because that's a very good point you made in the middle of the free fund, we doubled the amount of volunteer community moderators. They just appeared out of nowhere and started helping the community. So literally the team doubled in size in mod. And again, that's entirely organic and spontaneous. Um, and to your point, yeah, there's nothing like, you know, I think Pavel said it to me when we were here during the launch and I was saying, look, I know it's tough and we're all really tired, but like, how are you finding it? And his eyes lit up. He went, I've never had so many people working using my software. You have no idea what that feels like. And I said, oh, I do. <laughs> like, that's like cocaine for software developers, yeah. right? Tens, hundreds, maybe millions of people using your software. Mm -hmm. That's the most satisfying thing. And to Jakob's point, we are changing people's lives. The very first AMA we did this, I always say this tiny woman, I never saw her, it was a podcast. This very small, quiet African woman got onto the microphone and said, I just want to say something and said, I've never seen an opportunity like this before in my life. Whatever you do, please don't stop. And it was like, you could hear the emotion in her voice and I just got chills in my spine going, oh, you know, I'm not building video games or esports platforms anymore. This is literally going to change people's lives, you know? And I don't know if I shared it with you, but one of the, one of the community members, not a mod, but who finished quite high up um, in the leaderboard, wrote this really emotional message to me after saying, I don't think you quite understand the difference this is going to make to me and my family, like from day to day. And that kind of gives me shivers when you realize you're having that kind of impact on people, right? From mm -hmm. the to your point, yeah, those 7 a.m. starts and the being in the office at 11.30 at night and yeah, three crises today. It becomes worth it in the end, you know, when you get through it and have that kind of impact. Real software for real people, you know. Yeah, I remember I was, you know, watching, the, observing the team uh, that was fully focused working here. Uh, you came as well to to, to Poland to, to be with the team mm. uh, and to, to work during the, the uh, release. And uh, yeah, I, I feel, I must admit that not so often I see so uh people are so motivated to actually do the work and uh, so committed so they spend like the whole days sometimes even evenings in the office to just to make the the things right and uh and you know to fix all the problems all the issues uh, and uh, copy with with uh anything that that will appear 100 percent. being part of the back end that saved her um but in the end it was written by one of your engineers over a weekend just off his own bat he decided we need this i'm going to build it and without that, I think you'd admit we would have been even further behind than mm. what we were trying to do. And when it came to that manual verification piece, forget about it. We wouldn't have, I think we did that in about three to four days, the small team of us. Mm -hmm. That would have been completely impossible. I mean, that's 
manually verify 200,000 missions would, mm -hmm. would have been completely impossible without that system. Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay, so I've also heard from the team that you figure out a bunch of innovations. Uh, you already mentioned that you're combining some Web3 ideas into Web2 and the other way around as well. So could you tell us a bit more what, what is so innovative that you're working on, how how the way of work uh, that you are implementing is, is different from, from other projects and, and how does it work for you? First of all, uh, the idea, like, like in general, like the vision, let's put it, the vision, because, you know, like we are working for almost two years and uh, there were some uh, paths, direction that we headed to because at that point of time we thought that it is it will be useful for the community, for the product, but then we, we just changed it. So like having the user in front of us, this is like uh, from the web free perspective, this is the, the innovation and we actually include users um, during like all all the time that we are working on the product because I remember I think it was before before second sale mm. there was some user UX research uh, our user UX researcher Karina and Kasia did some um, did some uh, checking with with potential uh, users of our application then we launched beta on the test environment so we also invited user and we actually actively collected feedback with various of approaches. So we, we, we wanted to know as much as we can. And, and then, you know, like with community models, with, with, with inviting people to part of it, then we released this rewards program. So this is from my perspective that also the innovation in terms of, let's say, the approach mm -hmm. uh, to how we, how we develop. The, the second thing that we actually discussed today is the approach to um, let's say manage what we are doing and how we are approaching, uh, for example, the diligence of the project and 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 how we are checking if everything was mm. uh, done, prepared well. You know, like timelines, like the timesheets, uh, to be on top that we didn't forget about any, uh, anything. You know, so this is also from the web free perspective. This is kind of revolutionary. Yeah, <laughs> like using the, the the side that was already present in web two projects, uh, to, to web three and, uh, like, yeah, I think this, this are two major things that from the, let's say managing mm. uh, product, uh, that, that are innovative from my perspective. Yeah. We, 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 we did mention this today cause we often forget about it, right? But some of the people on the project who've been kind of more extensively involved in blockchain and cryptocurrency projects than I have been talk often about how amazed they are, how organized we are and how things are documented and. I remember at one point, some of the people from Master Ventures and Kyle's company, we were talking through some of the transaction flows and Max just casually threw aside this comment that this is the best documented project they'd ever worked on. And I'm like, but you invest in like 50 to 100 companies a year for years. Like how bad must things be <laughs> that made out this crappy little diagram we threw together is like the best thing you've ever seen. So I think bringing some of those best practices from software development and then with you guys from product development um, and bringing that into the heart of what we do has made a massive difference like that hybrid approach you know from the outside people you know maybe some of the folks in blockchain think we're slow compared to them but the point I always make is yeah but every contract is smart is every smart contract we have is audited we can stand over it there's not a single thing we've done that you know we wouldn't think it was the best possible solution to the problem at the time and I think that kind of sets a quality bar that we're trying to bring, you know, to that whole project as well. But sorry, what was the original, the question was about? Innovation. Like, what do you think is such innovation, innovative in, in the work that you are doing? Well, I think, I think that I'm working so closely with you guys is a big thing, right? I mean, we were talking earlier on about the difficulties with remote work as well, is that you have to have a different approach, particularly with multifunctional teams and we're working with customers than you do when everyone's in the same building. Um, I think the fact that, you know, we come over here quite a lot, um, like we're trying to come over every five or six weeks now and spend more time on site. I think we find we get a lot done in those short touch points and mm -hmm. the rest of it is kind of more day to day. But yeah, I think, and I think the model is quite innovative too, but on the technology side, there's been a huge amount of innovation and some of which we probably need to make a bigger deal, right? So I hope the new white paper will kind of lay some of that groundwork. 
but the white paper talks to the future and current innovations. It doesn't talk about the past ones. Like we've thrown away more stuff than some projects have developed. Mm-hmm. Right? We had, we made the decision earlier on to build on Ethereum because I had the best support. It was easier to hire for, etc. At the most um, amount of support and tooling and things on the back end. So it meant we could focus instead of building core tech, we could focus more on solving a user's problem. And a lot of that, when we decided to move to ZK Sync, we had to throw away. So we lost some work we had done there. And um, my biggest regret in a way was having to lose. We basically built a non-custodial um, smart contract wallet for our users that if you were new to crypto and didn't know how to add a wallet, didn't know what MetaMask was, we just gave you a non-custodial wallet. And we're able to pass the private keys to you in a way where no one in Commonwealth knew your keys were, could ever see them. So it was as secure as it could get. And they use the same open source uh, technology that Binance Wallet uses. And there are 13 million people using that wallet. Well, we managed to do it with two steps less. So it was a much better user experience and less friction than Binance did. And if that wallet had that kind of adoption, what would that have meant for our users? But unfortunately, when we moved to ZK Sync, we had to leave that behind. The good news is now we're moving to base. Um, so we have all the benefits of account abstraction and embedded wallets are going to be open to us. So... Mm-hmm. It will come back in a new and improved form, Mm -hmm. I'm sure. So that's a big one. The rewards piece that we mentioned and that whole points-based activity is really important. Actually, it's not just important as a marketing gimmick. It actually, I think, is the future for legal decentralization, Mm -hmm. which is another innovation we're bringing. Um, So just very briefly, the more decentralized the protocol is, the less susceptible it is to having to fall afoul of different uh, regulations and compliance. There's two approaches with compliance. You either lead into it and become completely legal in that place, or you do everything to avoid design around it so you don't have to be captured by that as well. And they're both valid legal approaches. And the interesting thing about decentralization is the more decentralized you are, the less anyone cares about you being regularly compliant. So we have a very interesting legal strategy we're applying, and then we're building a software layer around that. And again, so that the whole protocol is run without people managing other people and people doing things it's kind of the, the principle of kind of like if you and I are both contractors working on a house let's say mm-hmm. you know you're building the stairs you're a carpenter and I'm painting the walls it would not be in any way accurate to say that we are working together on that project we just happen to be both be employed to do different things for different parts of that project or the customer and we think that approach um, on a community wide basis is enough to keep us legally decentralized if it's got enough of the you know legal scaffolding in place but it needs this coordinating piece in the middle everybody in blockchain and web3 will tell you oh well blockchain's the missing piece you just need a token which is absolute and utter nonsense what you actually need is a way for people to cooperate and collaborate the token's just a way to pay them at the mm-hmm. end of the day and it doesn't mean because both myself and you guys both might have tokens, it doesn't mean any of us want to do the same thing in the same way, right? So so we realised that piece was missing. And again, it's detailed in the white paper, but that's another piece we got asked to hive off as a separate piece of tech. So for me, there's two out of, we have a third one I'll mention later, but that's probably one of the best external KPIs for innovation is that people keep wanting to use the software we're building for Commonwealth. They want to take it and use it somewhere else, which mm-hmm. I think is fantastic state of affairs for a project that we're still mid-launch if you like it'll be the middle of may before we're launched and we've three entire projects people want to take right so the points based activity system from rewards is actually going to be spread across the whole protocol people will get rewarded for every single thing they do on the platform customizing their profile investing staking voting on a governance decision because you've done something we give you a reward but i also have a measure of what you've done which again helps with decentralization because part of the big regulatory piece there is avoiding, you know, that somebody's trying to do something that will generate a profit, but they're doing it on your behalf. That's where both parties then get brought into sticky water. This way we can avoid that whole piece by having everyone actively manage themselves or cooperate with everyone else. And then it's, in theory, it's uh, a nice uh, heavenly uh, community sound. I think that uh, anyone who is interested to learn more about it should read the white paper that is going to be released soon. Most probably will be released after the video will be uh, before the video will be published. So it, it's sometime in the next two weeks, two to three weeks for sure. So, so I think it will be in the same time as the okay. video. So yeah, if you are interested, check the website join Commonwealth 
dot x y z, uh, and uh, and then you will find that there you will find the the white paper. Okay, I'm I'm not afraid to say that Commonwealth so far was a huge success. Uh, even that you're just somewhere in the middle of the of the road, or even I would say maybe in, somewhere in the beginning of the road. <laughs> uh, when I when I learn about your uh, learned about your roadmap and plans for the future. So, what do you think was the crucial factors of the success? Why it has been so successful? It is so successful. There's probably a couple of factors feeding into that. I think. I think. The, I think genuinely. I think the partnership with you guys. We've mentioned it a few times before. Is a massive factor because. I couldn't imagine doing that rewards program development with any other company, to be quite frank. Um, Dawson to try and do two things at once and, you know, step on the pedal, but don't drop the ball on the first one. And, you know, this is going to require quite a lot of additional effort. I think the network of people we have in the community, and by that I mean the wider community, like the Oracle's you know, about 30 different partners, I think. Um, and uh, these are like well, very well-known names who've invested in every crypto project you can think of, they've invested in. Um, to the community themselves, I think one of the innovative things I didn't mention was we built the application around the community. Most of the people, community is a Telegram channel or it's a few people on Twitter. For us, the community forums are right in the middle of the application itself, so there's zero friction. Mm-hmm. We plan on using those systems to actually feed quite a lot into the community in the app, including another innovation, which is your own NFT marketplace. If you have... Um, either one of our Genesis NFTs or you've got one of these fun slices and you want to sell it, you want to be liquid. One of the gaps in the market because of the state of regulatory compliance, it means that many of the big NFT marketplaces um, want to stay compliant themselves so they won't sell our NFT or list our NFT because it's got real world utility value but it's also in some cases um, a security. So there is no decentralized NFT marketplace purely for utility based NFTs. In a couple of weeks, we'll have launched our own listings inside the platform, but the plan very much is to hive that off as a standalone product that anyone can sell an NFT on. Again, it's another kind of service to the community, but using exactly the same technology and protocol we've already built. But yeah, I think again, that the wider community that I've mentioned, but that community of the OGs and the people who've been along that whole journey who, to Jacob's point, have helped us along the way. We're in dialogue with these people constantly. Um, um, I think that's been a massive success um, not just to be able to reach the community and get that message out but the people we seem to be talking to are very active and want to be active and hands on so I can only imagine you know what they'll get up to once we have the community fund up and running they're active in the forums every day they're able to split and sell their NFTs in seconds and you know I think at a piece I have to mention because myself and Jakob have spent so much time sweating over this is just the UX and the UI mm-hmm. we put so much effort and money into streamlining every aspect of that UX that it pays off every single user who goes in goes this is people describe it as not just being clean and simple and wow this is not like a beta product it's really polished they describe it as being one of the slickest experiences they've had on Web3 we've had people talking about how fun it is to do the missions and I'm like but it's basically filling in forms online <laughs> for anyone and people are saying best fun I've ever had doing these kinds of things so I think we're doing something right there and I think the measure of product market fit I would say is probably the the best judge of that yeah so yeah how, how does it look like from your perspective yeah I would add to that like um, um the uh, invitational language yeah like, because I, I had a chance to you let's say one of the first person to read white paper before it was uh, it, it published and what i could feel from the white paper and it's it's like it's constant among like all communication community that commonwealth is inviting people inside and for example having the community like the application built around the community is another example of that and from my perspective what is let's say innovative and unique uh, in that manner is uh, being, uh, let's say, uh, open and brave to change directions. As you Tony mentioned, we built some great piece of software, but we saw the possibility in better in, uh, in better use of yeah. the product of the, or the idea for the community, mm-hmm. and we changed it, and we just, okay, that's a pity, but it will be better the other way. Coming back to this invitational language, that uh, managing people 
uh, and stakeholders on the Commonwealth side, because there, are, as you mentioned, there are many of them. They are people who have a lot of fo followers, mm -hmm. and you know they are putting a lot of uh, value to Commonwealth. At the same time, uh, they might have many ideas. They might have, you know, like their opinions about some things, and like getting everybody on the same page, and uh, let's say driving this vehicle in one direction mm. that is that is also a challenge and it is and this is kind of also uniqueness from my uh, unique value from my perspective you know how to cooperate how to manage in the remote work plus you know some like a lot of people mm. working on the like contributing to the to the product yeah okay because you already mentioned about the transparency and also that you know like in almost every blockchain product that there is some kind of roadmap that is published. There are some tight deadlines. In your case, there was a lot of work. Some, yeah, someone would even call it a crunch. Well, how do you deal with this uh, from one side, the transparency level that you're providing to the community and from the other side, the commitment that you make to the community and the amount of work that, that is needed to be done? I think it's a, a to, to Jakob's point, we, we are really transparent. Like, and you know, I've been used to working in open source and been radically transparent and everything else. When I got to web three and I saw that was part of what this project was going to be about, to me, it made perfect sense because if you're going to build a community, you know, you want to build it on a trustless technology. That's great, but you have to have the trust first before you have the trustlessness. So it was a journey and it was kind of, okay, how can we show people that we're genuine from day one, especially when we're building in stealth for like nearly nine months to a year before they even know about it, right? Mm -hmm. So it was all about providing substance. I can go out and kind of write the best white paper pitch deck in the world. It doesn't mean I've got any lines of code written behind it or any substance to it, right? So the whole team, everybody working on this project has to be free and clear and let everyone see that we're genuine and honest. We did the same with our plans. Once we um, were revealed to the world, we were very open about what we were doing, how we were doing it, how we were building it. And that's only increased as we've grown and the community's grown. We've got more and more documentation about it now. We've made more and more commitments. You know, we were very open that when it came time to actually launch the platform and protocol, like we started at the end of the last bull market, literally my first day of the job was the first day of the new bear market. So it was a recalibration on day one, right? We cut the budget, we cut the scope of the project by two thirds. Um, but now as we, you know, we've revealed more and more, um, and as the narrative has progressed, we've been able to give people more certainty. Okay. We, we, you know, we're on ZK sync. We know they'll probably launch sometime in the Q1, Q2 next year. So we're going to align ourselves with that network to give everybody the best opportunity. So as the narrative has kind of shifted, we've had to adapt and pivot and we have a lot of these conversations are, they're very open. Um, some of them are they're like Kyle talks openly on his channel and quite like, sorry, Kyle Chasse is obviously one of the project's founders and has been incredibly influential not just in accepting the project, but in its promotion as well. So, you know, between the insight we have on the outside and the openness with the community, we have a lot of flexibility, I would say. Mm -hmm. But we've been careful not to jump too off into explicit dates unless we've had to. We only announced the dates for the IDO and the public sale last week, um, and that was two days after we confirmed them. So it literally took up till then to be able to lock that down. And then there's the other aspect to it, because after I had that conversation before Christmas with Tim and Dom where they were, they gave me their list of requirements for the rewards piece and that basically meant I was going to lose my Christmas not go on holidays and have to go back and have difficult conversations with the team and say I, we either need to work for three months on all this technology we're going to throw away just to integrate with other people to give the team what they want or we need to do the hard work and bring the foundation so that we're setting ourselves up for the best job in the future and about a week afterwards, after I'd gone to the team and we about two weeks actually, and we'd had time to digest it and think through how we might approach it. We still had more questions than answers, I think, at that point. I got put on the spot by Dom on one of the comments. He said, look, I need to go out and commit to launch pans and DEXs and centralized exchanges. I'm really nervous about giving them that date. And I said, the date is rock solid. I said, if the team have committed to and I've committed to, it will happen. And he still wasn't convinced. So I gave him one of my little anecdotes and I said, Lauren Lanning, the producer of Saturday Night Live, he said something once. He said, show goes out at 11 o'clock on a Saturday night, not because it's ready, not because it's perfect, because it's at 11 o'clock on a Saturday night. I mm -hmm. said, that's how we ship. I said, we'll ship on that date. 
and we did. Mm-hmm. To our credit, we did. From from what I hear from you, uh, you're doing this this blockchain product, blockchain startup, actually the opposite way than the most products are blockchain products are built and released. Like for example, you're releasing white paper after two years of, since starting the yes. Yeah. At the very beginning, you were like working in stealth mode for for a long time. Yeah. Like when the first time we we spoke with Tony, uh, we couldn't even provide the name for the startup, even that we already knew it. But but it was in stealth mode, so we didn't want to uh, to share it with anyone yet. Do you think that that this approach, this totally opposite approach to 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 let's say the the common uh, start blockchain startup way? Uh, it was also a success factor for you or? No, not exactly. It, you're right. It is. I forgot about that. It is actually quite different because we only had a light paper when we um, went out to do the first public sale. And we were probably spoiled a little in that the entire audience for the first public sale came from one video, a nine minute video that Kyle created. And I, I still tell him today, it's a masterpiece in marketing. He spoke for nine minutes without giving away a single detail of what we were building, which I thought was incredible, right? And the whole first sale was funded from that one video, right? So that and a light paper. We will leave this video in the uh, we, film caption. We linked this video. I, I still think it's fantastic. Um, but he, you have to bear in mind, in the last bull market, he was able to do the same thing for other protocols just by one project in particular. He threw a quick shout out and they made $500,000 in 24 hours from uh, directly attributed to that video. So, um, so we got off light, I guess, in terms of that sense. But recently when we were going, and we'd always promised we would do a bigger update on the white paper at some point. So yeah, so we put it off quite a long time and then we were, I had planned to do it in Q4 last year, but by then we were switching networks to ZK Sync. We were ramping up for TGE and on top of that then, in the middle of November came this rewards idea. Two weeks ago when I was sitting down reviewing the first, the final draft of the white paper, because I was the main author of both papers, but lots of people contributed. But now it gets refined and edited and torn apart and put back together. And when I was reviewing it with Tim, I went, I can't believe we left out so much in the light paper. We actually had all of the algorithms and everything for staking and unstaking were done. No technical detail was included. There was barely even description. And we completely forgot to mention, this is incredible when I think about it. It's an investment platform. We we completely forgot to talk about what happens with profit. (laughs) <laughs> in the light paper and no one commented on it and I'm still going how did no one like really it's an investment protocol you're going to invest your money in it but there's no mention of the profit like so people uh, are going to do this for fun <laughs> so to your point we did it completely back to front and yes look at where we are now right so with the community we have now like we brought in a lot more obviously because of the greater marketing and the reach we had through that rewards program so we have a third audience now which is the you know, the crypto hopefuls who just want to come and, you know, game your platform all day long to get a few tokens. So in this white paper, we've put quite a lot of detail into it. Um, and hopefully we've covered off almost all the questions, but literally once a day, I remember, I forgot to mention that in the white paper. Again, only mentioned a few days ago that we forgot to put in that we built the whole thing as a DAO and that's why we don't have job titles. So two and a half years in and we still forget some of these things, you know, so... So I don't think it was a contributing factor. It didn't hurt us though, which is interesting. I think probably because we had a captive audience who knew Kyle already. Cool. Uh, with the, all the knowledge and the experience that you get, uh, that you gained in the last two years, what would you do differently if you would start over? From the, let's say, managing perspective or like how we are working together, mm, definitely I would put uh, a little bit more emphasis on more meetings, <laughs> uh, like uh, face-to-face meetings, yeah, and just set like uh, some cadence of them, mm. so we are we are we are aware like what's going on and when we will meet and what we, what we will discuss. And the second thing is what we are actually working right right now is to make sure that uh, all the things like take to another le- even higher level or another level a documentation. Because it's like we have a lot of documents, we have a lot of documentation, we know what we are doing. At the same time, you know, you may say that if you strive for perfection, you are, you are always seeing the uh, glass half empty. Mm. So I see, you know, the, the place that we could do better. Uh, and and I think these two, these two things from, let's say, um, the things that we definitely as a team can influence in 100%, we, we could do differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 100% agree with that. Um, 
yeah, more face to face meetings, more of that coupling, not coupling exactly. Like you want to keep the flexibility and the kind of freedom that remote work gives everyone, but at the same time, you still need to keep up that degree of you know high standard of collaboration and communication and and coordination. The three C's there investing more into that process piece. Like I thought we'd invested quite a lot of process at the beginning, but I, personally, I was already very comfortable with the approach you guys took on products, whereas the rest of the team were not. So, but I think I would have spent a bit more time in those early days on the ground, just making sure we were all kind of even more tightly coupled in a way. And not that it was bad in any way, just that I think we could have been probably more productive more sooner. And actually, I, I do want to mention this because this is quite important because we were at a the Smart Connect conference in Barcelona at the Chainlink event a number of months ago. Oh, sorry, was it Barcelona? I can't remember which one it was. Barcelona or Istanbul. And we met with a company who started developing their app on almost the same week we started. Mm -hmm. So we had a team of, I think in total, I'm going to say seven people, but bear in mind some of those people are part-time um, in Pragmatic Coders, right? They had a team of nine people and they built seven workflows. And in the same time, we built 24 to 27 workflows, fully mobile and web with a team of seven people. And they were all in the same office, by the way, as well. They weren't even working. I didn't know that. So the di yeah, I think two of them were a mountain fiber in the office So um, in Lisbon. So the difference in productivity from them to us, and I'm sitting here going, yeah, we could be more productive. We could have got that out faster. <laughs> and I'm sitting here going, but that's my little bubble, right? I think that's a really important kind of not really a benchmark, but it's an informal benchmark I use um, when people are saying, oh, I'm spending so much money on dev compared to this DeFi project over there. I mean, the one without any UI, that one. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's a, that was a really good indicator of how well things have worked. And I'm not sure how I would do that differently other than, as you said, more time together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before I had this question, as uh, uh, what what would you recommend to anyone uh, who is working on their startup with the external service provider? Mm. But I think that it's better to ask it like in general. What would you recommend to to the any startup founders, anyone who is working on the startup with the external provider or even with the internal team? Like any any tips? Maybe you have some new lessons learned, new thoughts that you uh, that you would like to share. About working with external providers, yes, but. And I, I didn't give you an answer last time. You might not like it this time. But my advice to most people who want to start up a startup, especially a tech startup, is don't. Genuinely. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life. And the people like me who've been doing it for like 30 years are kind of, we're addicted to it. We can't do anything else. We don't know any other way to work. But no, I genuinely, I, I don't recommend it. I've seen in every startup, once you start, once the money starts running out, it becomes a completely different beast. And if you're a founder in a startup and you're sweating all day long about meeting the accountant and the lawyer and making your payroll, you're not working on your product. I just don't think it's a life for everyone. So I always say measure twice, cut once. So have a good long think about that one first because you're going to spend 60% of your time fretting over those details or the marketing and not on the product or the customer you wanted. So make sure that's what you're signing up for. But in terms of working with external vendors, yeah, I'm kind of, I got asked to write a book after our last video and I was putting it off for a long time. And to dialogue with Jacob, I kept thinking, Lots of books about product management. I'm going to write about the stuff that no one writes about that makes it really hard to do good products in tech. And the first place I started with thinking was communication, collaboration, coordination. It's all the soft stuff. It's mm -hmm. Making sure everybody knows what things are called is so important, especially in something like WEG3 where everything's a token and people are casually throwing those words around and we all think we know what we're talking about. It turns out we don't. Even on our same team with experienced people, we've got What's the definition of IDO versus TTE? Are they the same thing? Are they different? Things like the naming of the parts and how you're going to have those dialogues, how often you meet, mm -hmm. where you store things, how you onboard team members. That's the piece that just sucks up all the, the money and therefore brings in all the bad will. You know, I think if you and the customer are on the same page from day one and they've bought into your methodology or you know they've hired you because you're applying the methodology they like for developing products, it's just ironing out those kind of details after that. It's just talk to your customers and build what solves their problems, really. Simple as that. Jacob, any advices from you, from your recent experiences? From my recent experiences, uh, like if you are working in startup, forget about your job titles and, you know, do whatever is needed to deliver your value. As, as Tony mentioned, you know, when, when we released the rewards program, like everybody was doing everything what was needed right now. 
including, you know, like writing some SQL queries <laughs> and so on, like just to do the, the things that are required, because from my perspective, in terms of our uh, recent release, is that I uh, realized that we have actually two deadlines. And this is not so common uh, in product uh, releases because we have the first deadline of releasing and the, the rewards program. And we have the second deadline when the program finishes. I just uh, realized later that it would, it put on us like a double pressure. Yeah. Because, because you know, we need to be uh, very timely to deliver some of the things that might be helpful for uh, for our users, for community members, uh, you know, before <laughs> the, the rewards program finishes, you know, it's, mm -hmm. we cannot, you know, like postpone it for like one week mm -hmm. because there won't be a point in delivering that. So well, they want the results, right? The results were going to take a lead time after the e event finished. Exactly. So, so that, that, that is why, um, you know, like from my perspective, when you are working with the startup, you know, you might end up in like doing everything what's necessary. Mm -hmm. It's pretty interesting because uh, in one of the previous episodes where I was uh, talking with uh, Joe Justice, who was telling us about how the how Tesla works, how SpaceX work, and in each uh, Elon Musk company, like everyone is just an engineer, yeah? and mm. people are doing everything. If there is a track that needs to be unloaded, some engineers are going and unloading the track, <laughs> and that's not a problem to anyone. Yeah, uh, and uh, and the same with the engineering work, like even if you're accountants or responsible for the accounting, you also need to do some engineering work from time to time uh, as well. Is there anything else that you would like to add about the Commonwealth or, or anything else? Or uh, first of all, like, uh, could, you, could you tell to the people how to find more information about the uh, Commonwealth? Of course, the white paper, websites, but uh, also how to join the community. Jump into the app, it'll be the best place because you're going to find not just the functionality in there, but there's all the community in the forums. Um, Commonwealth website, of course, and the Telegram channel, but I don't really direct people to the Telegram channel or Twitter. It's not very useful. It's too noisy, in my opinion. So I would go to the white paper or into the app itself. Um, and the best thing I would say is if you go to any of those forums, just reach out. I promise you they've got the friendliest community moderators in the world. Mm. Um, they can't answer a question for you. There's a good chance the team can't either, to be frank. So they're probably the best places to go. Yeah. Twitter, Telegram, the app, and the website. I'd recommend the app. Okay, so thank you very much. I hope that you enjoyed this discussion. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube, uh, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts uh, channel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pragmatic Talks is delivered to you by Pragmatic Colors, the first choice software development partners for startup founders. Be sure to catch all new episodes. Subscribe to our YouTube, Spotify or Apple podcast channels. And if you are thinking about building your own startup or struggling with product development, contact us and find out what we can do together.